That divorce business, is that what you get when you pay a woman not to live with you? It's about it. HBR Talk with Hannah Wallen. Among the various political factions arguing gender issues during the last century, there are a variety of opinions regarding human rights, social issues, and potential solutions. But one thing I think every group can agree on is that divorce is awful. That's not a condemnation of anyone who is divorced, but a recognition that it's an undesirable situation that comes with a laundry list of hard-to-face challenges, especially if the divorcing couple has children. One challenge that, at least within the system, doesn't get the treatment it deserves is one parent's use of the couple's children as a tool of abuse against the other parent, or the in-laws. In relation to this, we've previously discussed custody interference and its impact on parent and child. While non-custodial mothers do also experience this, it more frequently impacts fathers, as census data shows that custody is awarded to mothers over 80% of the time. In their report, Frequency of Visitation by Divorced Fathers, Differences in Reports by Fathers and Mothers, Braver, Walchik, Sandler, Fogas, and Zvetina explained the following. 20% of custodial parents said they saw no value in the non-custodial parents' visits and admitted attempting to sabotage them. Two different sources described custodial parents reporting they had interfered with a non-custodial parent's visitation on at least one occasion to punish their ex-spouse. One source put the number at 22%, the other at 40%. A quarter of custodial parents admitted denying visits, while a third of non-custodial parents reported being denied visits. In some of the worst cases of interference, the custodial parent or guardian psychologically manipulates the child to become hostile to the non-custodial parent. Edward Cruck, Ph.D., University of British Columbia, describes this. Parental alienation, which most commonly occurs in the context of child custody disputes during and after parental separation, involves the programming of a child by one parent to denigrate the other target parent in an effort to harm, damage, and destroy the relationship between a child and the target parent, whereby the target parent is demonized and undermined as a parent worthy of the child's love and attention. Such denigration results in the child's emotional rejection of the target parent and the loss of a capable loving parent from the child's life. This is bad enough in light of existing information indicating that separation of a child from one parent denies the child of influences that are vital to psychological, intellectual, and character development. We know, for instance, that from early childhood, father involvement enhances a child's social-emotional development. The effects of father involvement continue through the school years, leading to better academic performance and participation, fewer school issues, more independent conflict resolution, and a higher graduation rate. The effect continues with better post-secondary education and career outcomes, resulting in reduced incidence of unwed and teen parenthood, welfare dependence, and criminal behavior. In his paper, Parental Alienation is a Form of Emotional Child Abuse, Current State of Knowledge, and Future Directions for Research, Edward Cruck argues that the behavior is definitely abuse. He states, for the child, parental alienation is a serious mental condition based on a false belief that the alienated parent is unworthy to be a parent. He goes on to explain that its two core elements, that it is a serious mental condition and it results from a series of alienating strategies of alienating parents, correspond to two core components of child abuse. It represents a significant form of harm and poses a serious threat to the well-being of the child and... It is a result of human action. Women's groups who oppose recognition of parental alienation because targets are more often fathers and their extended families claim that the behavior is harmless, but the report cites a variety of sources indicating harm. According to these sources, children who are manipulated to hate one of their parents in turn end up experiencing self-hatred, feelings of worthlessness, of being flawed, unloved, or unwanted by the alienated parent, of only being of value in meeting another person's needs, and of severe guilt related to betraying the alienated parent. They also experience disrupted social-emotional development, lack of trust in relationships, social anxiety, and social isolation, 
and they end up having poor relationships with both parents. They can become codependent with the alienating parent, even in adulthood. Their academic and professional outcome potential is damaged, and they are more likely to engage in the very same self-destructive behaviors that father involvement is known to make less likely. The impact on men was described in a heavily sourced letter to the editor, published in Psychiatria Dubina, 2015, Volume 27, Number 3, pages 288 to 289, titled Parental Alienation and Suicide in Men, by Leo Scher, M.D., who has published several articles on male suicide. In his letter, Dr. Scher pointed out that the experience of parental alienation as children was associated with depression and substance abuse, both of which are associated with suicidal behavior. He further stated, The predominant feelings among alienated parents are helplessness, powerlessness, and growing despair. Fathers who have lost some or all contact with their children for months or even years following separation or divorce are sometimes depressed and in a severe suicidal crisis since the loss of contact or restriction of the relationship between the children and the father is a very upsetting and painful experience for both the children and the father. This may contribute to suicide in men. Possibly, a decrease in the number and intensity of parental alienation cases may reduce suicidality in men. Obviously, to deny a child the involvement of a dedicated parent without cause is abusive in and of itself to both the child and the denied parent. Manipulating the child to participate in that denial is reprehensible. It may also be a shot aimed squarely at the alienating parent's own foot. One can easily recognize the value of partnership and parenting even after a divorce. Unnecessarily eliminating the other parent from the lives of the couple's children means removing a potential resource from the alienating parent's life. The alienated parent cannot present a unified front with the alienating parent for the sake of important things like rule enforcement, laying out academic expectations, or using discipline as a teaching tool. Programming the child to refuse engagement with the alienating parent makes reliance on that parent for caregiving, even in an emergency, unlikely at best. And remember, that impact takes place in a household in which the children are more likely to experience behavioral issues due to the absence of involvement with the alienated parent. Alienated parents are also less likely to keep up on child support payments, financially impacting the alienating parent's household. Eventually, children who experience this phenomenon grow up, and they often learn information that contradicts the narratives that were used to turn them against the alienated parent an experience that can be devastating to the child's relationship with both parents. This behavior really is a no-win strategy. Isn't it about time our family court system was adjusted in order to put a stop to as much of it as possible? Tune in to HBR Talk as we discuss this phenomenon and the recent screening of Erasing Family, a film which investigates family bond obstruction from multiple perspectives. That event was co-hosted by the Badgers on October 12th in Saskatoon. HBR Talk streams on multiple platforms. You can tune in Thursday at 7.30 p.m. Eastern via the link in the low bar or find other viewing and listening options for that time or later on badgerfeed.com.